Hey guys, we're off cooldown once again this week for our fourth upkeep episode. So this week, we're gonna talk about the Game Awards. So they recently released their list of nominees for 30 different categories. And while we were looking through them, we actually realized that we haven't played that many new games this year. And a lot of, like me personally, a lot of games I was waiting for to release actually got delayed into next year. So... It made me realize that my like whole list of games that I played this year are mostly old games or re-releases of old games which came out this year like the Mass Effect trilogy and stuff like that and they also got a Switch so that's a new big backlog for me. How about you guys? What's your general like impression of this year's DJs before well, we get into the nitty gritty? It's actually pretty similar for me in that uh, mostly I've been playing backlogs games um, and I think I've been sticking a lot to the old familiars, so a lot of Dota, a lot of Apex. Uh, I haven't really been playing too much of the new games that came out this year. Maybe just like three or four here and there, I think, all in all. Well, for me, I've been playing games as part of my work, but not as deep as I want to. Like, I have, I barely finished any games this year from the games that I've started playing, but I've been able to sample a lot of games, uh, new games for this year. So there are a couple of games that I saw from the list that are I am at least familiar with because I am at the very least keeping up with the new games that are coming out this year. But in terms of intimacy with these games, I don't feel like there's a lot of love lost between me and these games. So while I'm familiar with a lot of the games that we'll be talking about or seeing here in this episode, I'm still for the most part this year been sticking to like what Del said to the old games that we've been playing over and over again like Dota and uh, as for me I've been playing Axie a lot this year but that's not actually a new game so yeah okay so let's start we're planning on going down the list backwards this year so that we end with the game of the year one so the first category we're seeing right now is best esports event so the nominees were the 2021 League of Legends World Championships, the International 2021 for Dota, the PGL Major Stockholm for CSGO, the PUBG Mobile Global Championship, and the Valorant Champions Tour. So personally, I'm not sure if I would give it to either TI or the PGL Major. Both of them are pretty good. Uh, PGL stands out a bit because it's the first, like, event with a whole stadium with an audience since the long time we've been here in the pandemic so that's kind of notable how about you guys actually just a little side note there uh isn't it right that the pgl major stockholm was held in the arena where ti was supposed to happen oh, was it oh yeah i think so it's, it's the avici arena right in stockholm. yeah yeah so yeah it's it's like a shame it's such a shame because um, TI had to move from Stockholm to Bucharest because of some issues and because Bucharest didn't really have that nice situation for COVID there, they were forced to um, hold the entire event with no audience which is a big shame because I really appreciated the production value of TI. You know, there's been a lot of issues in terms of connectivity, in terms of following the scheduled the program in TI, but in terms of production value, how beautiful the sets are, how beautiful the AR, the, the augmented reality sets were, it was really good and it would have been awesome if there were people who were able to experience those firsthand. Well, that's just, a, that's just an aside for me, but in terms of esports events this year, um, I've only watched actually TI here and a little bit of League of Legends. I was part of some of the events for Valorant and I'm actually a bit sad that Valorant champions won't be making this year's TGA because I think it's going to be really awesome this year. It's going to ha be happening um, the first half of December which is around the time where TGA will be happening as well. So Valorant champions Berlin uh, isn't going to make it for this year's TJ. So I'm looking forward to next year's and seeing Valorant Champions Berlin being on the list. But we have Champions Tour Stage 2 Masters here. I think there's a um, big testament to these games where their major tournaments are appearing in the best esports events category. But yeah, that, that's that's how I feel about this. 
category. How about you, Del? Have Have you watched any aside from TI? So I watched TI then, of course, and I watched the only the, the, the grand finals of the PGL Major um, on Twitch. And I have to say that as much as I wanted to give it to TI, like one part I guess was the live crowd that, that definitely had a really big impact on the hype. But on top of that, TI had so many technical mess ups considering how big of like just how grand that stage was and how much money was supposed to have been poured into the the, the whole technical side of it. Like I think TI Tell and TI Ten went pretty well. I was a big fan of the after shows. They got a nice panel and everything, but there were a lot of technical issues and there was just something lacking in it overall compared to the previous TIs aside from like you know the crowd machine aside like that we've we, we mean that to hell and back already so yeah I would definitely have to say that like, I want to I'm gonna have to give it to the PGL major uh, I watched a little bit of worlds too but I did find that the format is what the, my biggest issue uh, with worlds because it's just stretched out over so much time that you kind of just well I don't know if it's just me but like if between big games in the worlds format you gotta just lose hype for everything that's going on Hmm. Yeah, I find the the world's t- format a bit uh, hard to follow. Also, it's like stretched out, and it takes a long time to like finish the whole tournament. So it's a bit the hype kind of dies down, especially if you're like coming from like not regularly watching. But you know, in terms of storylines, um, the the tournaments that we've been talking about, TI, PGL Major. Uh, the World Championship for League of Legends. All of them had great stories, actually. Ti, the Cinderella run of Team Spirit, totally unexpected victory there by the CIS team, and also in parallel for PGL Major, the Natis Vincere Championship. Um, correct. Um, with yeah. with Simple finally winning a major, and in League of Legends, another upset. Um, the the defending champions lost against Edward Gaming, which nobody also expected. So there's a lot of emotions in all three of these tournaments, and I think it's a great year for esports fans everywhere. Since you know esports events are finally coming back in the grand stage that we've been accustomed to before COVID, and I think next year will be even greater. So, yeah, yeah, it's definitely something to look forward. To. All right. Uh, let's move on to the next category. It's best esports coach. Oh, I think this one's kind of tough to talk about. I would give it to probably Blade for coaching Navi for so for a while now. It's also worth mm. noting that um, during the PGL major, Navi didn't drop a single map. Yeah, that's a, definitely a big testament to the team's dominance right now. No other team has done that in a major yet. Uh, the uh, silent, the coach for Team Spirit, is also the most veteran like player out of the six of them, including his five, his five actual team. He's been to a lot of TIs. He's like a really old name in CIS Dota. So I guess we we should also give him some props for like coaching this team of relative underdogs to the biggest prize pool in esports. But if you are going to choose Cal, mm. who are you going to choose between Silent and Blade? Or no, who, I would probably, service? I would choose Blade because Navi has been like on an upturn for like the couple, like the past two years during the pandemic. They've been like slowly, uh, climbing, climb because they've always been like a pretty strong team ever since like Simple joined. Even before that, they were strong, but like simple was like everyone's been expecting simple to win a major once he like got into navi since like in 2016 but it's been five years now and this is the only time they've finally gotten it like they're always like short by they've made it to a couple of grand finals and always fell short and this time finally they got it so i think i would choose blade i'm not too familiar with the other coaches in this yeah, me neither. Well, we can tell that they're from Gambit, from FaZe Clan, and I think Kokoma is from either T1 or... Um, what's the name of the defending champions? Sorry, I'm not so familiar with League of Legends. I kind of forget. But yeah, I don't really have any strong opinions for this category. How about you, Del? Well, the same thing goes for me because, like I said, I haven't really been following a lot of the 
uh, three sports events outside of TI-10. So I don't feel like I have a properly formulated opinion on this particular category. Naturally, like I'd be leaning towards Silent because he's what I'm familiar with and he's the one I've seen the interviews of during <laughs> TI-10. Okay. For esports team, we have Atalanta Phase for COT, uh, DWG Kia for LOL. Yeah. All right, so they were the the, the defending champions, the... DWG. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> now I remember. Okay, and then now V for CS:GO, Sentinels for Valorant, and Team Sprint for Dota. I'm actually kind of hyped this year because two two CIS teams are in this <laughs> category, even so... if they're for different sports. For all throughout this year, I've been writing a lot of articles about Sentinels. Um, mm. Mostly because at the start of the year, they were embroiled, or one of their players was embroiled in controversy. And it was replaced with Tens, who turns out to be a better fit and who contributed to the team enough for them to win multiple major championships in um, in Valorant. And for an esports you know, for an esports title as young as Valorant, you can consider Sentinels something like um, Navi back in the day for Dota 2 when they won T- TI. Well, it's too early to tell since Sentinels still hasn't won this year's uh, Valorant Worlds Championship in Berlin. But I think it's safe for me to like 80% chance for them to win this year's championship. And you know they've just really been consistent and i just feel like um them not being able to win the championship yet this year really puts them in a disadvantage in this category but yeah um in terms of consistency i'd give it to sentinels but in terms of what has already been accomplished this year i'll give it to team spirit for their impressive run in ti mm. i would actually give it to navi cuz they've been like almost at the top for like the past couple of years so that they finally broke their ceiling this year with the major so i'd probably give it to them though team spirits run at the eye is incredibly impressive as well i've been following sentinels a little bit because when valorant first came out i actually played a little bit of it and i was a fan of tens because uh he had these yeah like, well back when he was in cloud nine their youtube channel was producing these video guides for uh using the various characters and tens one in particular had a uh, he had a Viper guide, and I was playing Viper at the time. I stopped playing Valorant since, but I still stuck to watching Tens. I would keep up with the streams. And like the thing about Valorant is that it's such a young esports scene, right, compared to how old like CSGO and how storied Dota is already, which is why I'm pretty interested to see where Sentinels is going to go and how uh, they're, they're kind of poised right now to take the upcoming Valorant World Championship. So we still have no idea how that's going to go. So it's pretty exciting for a young scene and a, you know, a fresh-faced team because of the scene being so young. But, you know, I'm still biased towards Team Spirit also because they, they did the, they basically did the TI8. Uh, we already talked about this in detail before, like the, the Cinderella run that OG did in TI8, seeing it something similar, if not, but somewhat different because like these players, aside from uh, their coach and from, uh, was it Liposhka? Everyone yep. else is so, yeah, they're, they're all really young, fresh face, first TI and all that. But I do think that um, from what I do know, it might not be as much as Cal for sure, it might not be as much as the average fan. I have to give it to Na'Vi. Like, I think the best esports team has to go to Na'Vi simply because of the fact that they had gone through the Major without dropping a single map. Like That is an incredible feat in and of itself. And I know just enough about CSGO to know what kind of a feat that is. You know? Yeah, it's pretty unprecedented. Alright. For the next category... Best esports athlete. Oh, this one's kinda. So the nominees are Simp, Showmaker, Collapse, Simple, and Tens. So I think we're gonna be talking about the three esports we've already mentioned the past two categories as well. I'm gonna give this to Simple because he's been the MVP for so many tournaments. He's been MVP in some tournaments even when they lost. And they've been to a couple of major finals now. They finally won their major. This feels like his like crowning moment of the year. No, there's like he's been deemed as the best CSGO player ever for like a couple of years now. It's about time we give him his crown. 
you know, I guess that's not to say that we're taking away from the other two esports mm. and the other two uh, people, the other two esports players. Like we, yeah, we listed here. It's just that we don't, we're not familiar enough with the other two scenes to actually have a, you know, properly formulated opinion on the matter. Mm. Uh, but my vote would probably have to go to Collapse. Uh, fresh face, but now he has solidified himself. Like when everybody, whenever anybody, even in your pub games, picks a Magnus. If you perform well, you're called Collapse. If you perform well, if you perform badly. People will joke about you trying to be collapsed. Like he's it's his first TI, he won it, and his performance uh, was has been so consistent. He's a post three that people have to make considerations of banning his picks first, just because of how much impact he has on the Mars, on the Tide Hunter, on the on the Magnus, especially as we've seen in all those games. I just think, yeah, like I, I know of the legend of Simple. I've watched enough about him. The the Score Esports had a video, a very long video about who he was in his story. But it just has to go to collapse. Obviously, I'm biased because I play the game and I'm a bigger fan of watching Dota esports than the other ones. But yeah, hands down for me, it has to be collapsed this year. Hmm. You can also tell how much impact collapse had in the community because right after DI, people have been spamming his heroes even though they don't know how to play them. Like, I've been seeing a lot of mangas <laughs> in my pops uh, after DI. It was really, you know, it was fun because it, it meant easy wins for us because people don't know how to play Magnus so we just kept on trashing them but yeah it, it just goes to show how good Collapse was in TI and I, I'm really looking forward to how his career will progress uh, moving forward but I also want to give a shout out uh, to Showmaker because he's being you know it, it tells a lot about how good you are if even though I'm not that familiar with League of Legends, I keep on hearing his name, reading articles about him, and um, uh, being impressed by his track record so far. It's being called as something like the next Faker. Uh, they didn't win this year's Worlds, sure, but his performance was really good um, that it's being called the next Faker, as I've said already. And it's something like, uh, I, I, I was just really impressed with how he took that compliment. He said, there's no one, some, there's no nobody else that is like Faker. And he just wants to be known as Showmaker. So he wants to pave his own uh, legacy. Instead of being known as the next Faker, he just wants to be known as Showmaker. He wants to build his own kingdom in League of Legends. And I'm also here to see that happen. So uh, for me, I, I think... Showmaker and Collapse are um, tied for this category for me. Mm. Okay. For the next category, best esports game. So it's Call of Duty, Counter Strike Global Offensive, Dota 2, League of Legends, and Valorant. I would give this to. Oh, actually, it's a toss up between CSGO and Dota for me. Those are the two esports games that I follow extensively, but I actually can't choose between them very well. I'm not sure how I feel about the this year's Dota 2 DPC system. There, I feel like it still doesn't give enough room for Tier 2 and Tier 3 teams to grow. I, f I kind of like the way Counter-Strike handles like their rotating tournament organizer systems, and it's not like super top heavy like Dota 2 is with TI that TI kind of overshadows everything so I'm not really sure which of the two I would choose here I think okay. for me right um, aside from the like you already mentioned um, like the the systems that we have in place and the format that we have surrounding these things I don't know if I want to give like I love TI 10 but I don't know if I wanted to give it to Dota specifically this year because the patch that TI-10 came out with was basically the patch of Tiny. And there were a lot of games that just weren't that interesting to watch because he was there. <laughs> like, I feel like there was a lot of balancing that had to be done before TI rolled around. And it, it hadn't happened by the time it was there. And here's, I, I have a bit of a hot take, very controversial opinion. Um, I don't know how esports ready Valorant is in its current state especially considering how quickly they're releasing operators without balancing previous ones. Uh, yeah, like, very hot take, probably very controversial, but that's what how I see Valorant right now. It's very young esports, so it has a long way to go. But I also don't think that uh, the way that Riot does their releases, similar to League of Legends, where they release a new uh, champion very, very often, I don't know if it works as well for a CSGO-type game. So 
I think I'd have to go for CSGO just because of how solidified like basically everything in the game is they don't change all that much anymore and I feel like that has been a good thing for people who have been watching the esport for a long time because um, you know there's a lot of stored history in the game in the format in the maps and all that and in the strategies but you still see enough shake up every year to make it interesting well for me hands down in terms of prize pool dota is going to be taking the cake here but you know being the best esports game goes beyond just having a very large prize pool it also talks about the community you have how healthy the um tournament circuit is how welcoming it is to new teams to grassroots a uh, grassroots team to enter your competitive circuit and in dota 2 you don't really see that a lot anymore you know there are still young ones but in terms of grassroots teams you know breaking it through the mold you rarely see that in dota 2. Uh, i might be a little biased here since i've been organizing some valorant events recently but the way I've been seeing how Riot Games is handling Valorant, I've been impressed so far. And for a uh, debut year, I think Valorant really did really well. And I, I do agree with Dell's take on Valorant's um, current you know, balancing issues and its meta still shifting a lot. But in terms of the entirety of the, you know, the esports scene of Valorant, uh, I'm really impressed by it for its first year and i think it deserves getting the best esports game for this category for the for the award for this category rather hmm. okay for our next one okay most anticipated game oh yeah oh actually seeing the choices now you know when you when, when you ask us earlier during our pre-production meeting on which game mm. we'll be voting here for most anticipated game Del and Elden. I almost immediately said Elden Ring, but now seeing the the choices here, I'm actually torn because I I really look forward to all of these games. You know, I uh, spoiler alert: we're planning to do an open world episode one of these days, and one of the games that I'd like to explore in that episode is Breath of the Wild, and it's been a long while since I revisited that game, but whenever I take a look at videos of that game or listen to reviews or listen to um, game critics of that game, I keep on getting reminded on just how good and how revolutionary Breath of the Wild was. And I'm looking, I'm really looking forward to its sequel and seeing how Nintendo will be taking the game to the next level. You know, Breath of the Wild introduced a lot of new features or uh, new trends in open world gaming that really took the entire genre to the next level and just thinking about what Nintendo could potentially introduce in the Breath of the Wild sequel makes me feel really excited you know because we don't know yet what's coming for this Breath of the Wild sequel as far as Elden Ring is concerned, we've already seen how it looks like and it makes us feel excited and it hypes me up. I want to play the game because it looks really good. But the potential of what Breath of the Wild 2 can bring to the table is what's making me anticipate that game a little bit more. And you know, Starfield also is something that I'm looking forward to play in the future, but it being an Xbox Series X exclusive makes it flow right just under my radar at this point you know i don't know if i'm gonna get an xbox series x somewhere down the line and i think this is the kind of game you should be playing on a console instead on a pc so yeah i'm interested in that game but not as interested uh as i am in elden ring and in breath of the world 2. how about you guys for uh, me no. oh okay no you go ahead you go ahead. okay i'll go first as the resident sony shell out of the three of us, my choice would be actually between God of War Ragnarok or Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, these two are actually my most anticipated games for last year. They both got delayed into next year. So they're still here in this category. Uh, I would actually give it to Horizon right now. Because I've seen the visuals of that game, the new gameplay that they released. It looks amazing. I can't wait for... Like, to swim around in the new underwater areas. Uh, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion, but I feel like a lot of people don't like underwater levels, but I 
Really, really love them. <laughs> so I'm super hyped for the next Horizon. God of War Ragnarok is very intriguing, but I'm just a really big fan of the way Sony first party games does open world. So it's kind of like the Assassin's Creed formula, but pared down with less fluff. Which is exactly the kind of open world game that I like. So I'm pretty hyped for New Horizon, especially the combat. Uh, I can't wait to set up a bunch of traps and hunt giant mecha monsters again. So yeah. Okay, so out of the four out of the five, I mean, four out of the five games, as much as I know my vote is probably going to go to Elden Ring, I have to say that I am very excited for Breath of the Wild and for the same reason that Newt is, because I really loved the first game. I collected all of the Korok seeds. And got nothing for it, but I collected all of them. And uh, yeah, they, as we're gonna, we we're probably gonna talk more in detail about it in a later episode. But I love Breath of the Wild so much, and it's it's the first time that I really felt this sense of real exploration in recent history for games, where it felt like no one was telling me where to go. I didn't have these quest markers. I mean, sure, you had the quest markers, but I didn't follow them. Like I, I was going from point A to point B, and it was just felt like a breath, a breath of fresh air, uh, gameplay wise. So I'm really excited to see what they do with the sequel. But uh, if no playable Zelda, then I riot. Um, but yeah, my, my vote, I think, still has to go to Elden Ring because I am a FromSoft uh, simp. And Elden Ring looks like everything that I love about the Souls series. Like the, the RPG nuanced character builds uh, where you can pick and choose your options to decide the way that you want to play. Except it's not Corridor Simulator anymore, right? Like... You have this open world to explore. They added a stealth mechanic. I feel like it's it's just all the all of my favorite parts of Dark Souls layered on top with lots of extras that we didn't even know we wanted. Like that's the same way that I felt about Sekiro when it came out and I played it. And I feel like Elden Ring is even more of that goodness, and then a lot of other things that we weren't that we aren't even expecting. So yeah, from the the hours of footage that I've seen from various content creators already from their network test, I'm hyped. And so my, my vote really goes to Elden Ring. But I do also have to mention God of War Ragnarok because I feel like the God of War PS4 game was probably one of the best rehashes that I've seen in recent history. Like, I've never cared for the God of War series up until that game came out. And I watched, uh, I watched somebody play through it. Like, I actually care about Kratos. I care about his son. I feel like the world and the writing was properly crafted. I don't know if that was true for the previous games because they just didn't appeal to me. They were like this hyper-masculine Kratos smashes everything hack and slash games. And then they hit you out of left field with this very story-driven RPG that has, that's seen, that to me at least, has a lot more to say under the hood than the previous games. So I'm very interested to see what direction they're taking with God of War Ragnarok. Hmm. All right. I'm actually pretty hyped for Elden Ring even if I don't usually play from soft game my brother has been talking my ear off about this game for so it's long it's time to it's about time to get into them yeah he, oh, yeah, he tells also, me yeah. i'll probably like it but you know yeah, i've never played horizon <laughs> i was gonna say <laughs> elden ring feels like the game that's also fun to watch so i think you still get a load of fun watching your brother play elden ring when it comes out even if you don't do get to play it you know the visuals are really good the the, the monsters the, the enemy design here is really good. Uh, I've seen the dragon. Um, I, I've seen videos of uh, characters fighting that knight with the really uh, elegant, glorious horse. And the horse looks really good. And the animations are f- smooth and fluid. And it just feels like a game that's, you know, fun, fun to watch on streams or even, you know, being as a backseat gamer watching someone else play it seems like a great time to me yeah and i just wanted to mention starfield because uh i'm a big fan of like the, the fallout series but i feel like bethesda hasn't really been putting out anything that great and also because of how long starfield's been in development it might still be running on their creation engine which is so dated by now like people have already pushed for example, Skyrim to the very limits that it could possibly go by with the constant re-releases and all of the mods to try to rehash all the engine problems. But if it's still running on the creator engine, I, I just don't see Starfield being, you know, anything that great, especially because of what they did with the Fallout series. Like, I, I just don't know if I can trust Bethesda with these kinds of games anymore. So, Starfield, like, it's, I don't think, personally, I don't think it belongs on the most anticipated games list. It could be replaced by something better. Mm. 
Yeah, personally, I would probably put FF16 here over Starfield. <laughs> but that's just me. Uh, I also have my expectations of Bethesda much, much lower than it used to be after Fallout 4 came. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. For the next category, it's best debut in the game. So, hmm. The Artful Escape, The Forgotten City, Kenna, Bridge of Spirits, Sable, and Valheim. I've actually played one of these. <laughs> so I played Valheim this year with yeah, a bunch I of think, I think that that goes for all three of us. I'm not sure with Del, but for me, I've only played Valheim among these five. I have played Valheim. I've played a little bit of Sable, but I've watched Sable. Hmm. And uh, between those two, best debut indie. I think Valheim is an absolute blast with friends. But I do think that Sable, personally, is the better game. Uh, Overall. Yeah. It's it's a single-player experience about exploration, and it has an emphasis on character. Um, where, in the world of Sable, basically, your, your mask defines your possession, your like your profession and the way that your life is going to go. And Sable is about collecting different masks and discovering who you, the character you're playing, is. So, it's, it's a pretty interesting take on it. It's got some puzzles. It's got a lot of open world expanse to explore. I, I feel like it's touched me more artistically than Valheim has, even if I've only wa- played a little and watched the rest of it. But I do think that Valheim is a blast and it has a good chance of winning, I would say. Mm-hmm. If not for the really slow rollout of all the other updates, but then, you know, the, the studio uh, behind, the developers behind, uh, even if they're published by Coffee Stain, they're a very small group of developers, so it's understandable that the updates roll out slowly. Hmm. I actually won uh, out of the six here, oh, the five here, I'm actually pretty interested in Kenna. Even when it showed up in like, when the PS5 was not released yet, it's one of like their showcase games. I really want to play it. I don't have a copy yet, but I only got a PS5 very recently, so I still have uh, quite a backlog for that console. So yeah, I think I would also give it to Valheim just because of how fun it was to play this with friends. It's pretty crazy, even if I just mostly built a giant longhouse <laughs> <laughs> actual architect all right you know when you talk about indie games uh when you when you talk about or explore the spirit of indie games it actually falls for me it actually falls in one of two categories the first one is artful you know in the games you know them as expressions or creative expressions so they're like artworks and i think that's where sable can uh, Forgotten City and Artful Escape fall under. And then you have this other category of indie games where you just do dumb stuff, dumb fun stuff with your friends. And I think Valheim has loads of that. It, it uh, The time I played with Valheim was really a blast. Um, it was like going back to the previous age with my friends just being monkeys. And it's, it was really fun. And I really think that it, it deserves getting a, at least a this nomination at the very least but in terms of the complete package in terms of the experience how beautiful the game is for a studio that was originally making feature films i think they did really well in making kenna bridge of spirits i haven't played the game but i have seen a lot of gameplay videos uh, impressions and watch a ton load of uh, game uh, streams of Kenna and I've actually enjoyed watching uh, people play the game and I really think it deserves getting this award over Valheim so yeah mm-hmm. my vote goes for Kia okay for our next category oh content creator of the year I think I don't have any comments about this one <laughs> I'm not either. I don't usually watch yeah, streamers uh, so none of yeah. the content creators I watch are any of these so yeah I, I think we can move on to we the just, next category for this one we'll leave that to your viewer discretion and your own opinion on that yeah for best multiplayer we have back for blood knockout city it takes two monster hunter rise new world and valheim it is uh, really interesting because people look for different things when they play multiplayer games uh the clearest well, I wouldn't call it discrepancy, but the clearest difference here is between It Takes Two and uh, something like Back for Blood. In Back for Blood, you play with your friends 
up to three other friends who you know fight against hordes of zombies in different waves and stages and you just shoot around killing zombies and moving from point a to point b while it takes two is all about you know having an experience with uh with another person a unique experience of the two of you working together to patch things up to develop a better relationship uh, so to speak and yeah I, i think it's very hard to decide on which game should get the award here because these games aim to uh, give different kinds of experiences to the people who are playing them and they achieve uh, their goals and uh, yeah all of them achieve their goals and but it just so happens that their goals are vastly different from each other so it's really hard to judge it's really hard to choose between them but yeah Valheim really lots of fun playing Valheim but I think uh, I'll give it to It Takes Two just because of how impactful it has been to many people who have played it. Hmm. Mm, for me personally, I only have first-hand experience of Valheim out of the games that were nominated. But I do have to say that this year, I all actually got into Monster Hunter. Like, I've, I've tried World and I've tried the old PSP games. It never really clicked with me. But when I tried World again this year with a bunch of friends, I finally understood why people love this game. <laughs> so it's actually really fun with friends but I can't play it alone so yeah I'm looking forward to Rise coming out for the PC next year I'll probably grab it okay, so I, I played Rise extensively this year I think I've clocked in almost 200 hours I've only ever played with one other well two other friends uh, one of my online friends and my brother uh, I've only ever done co-op in pairs of two the three of us have never hunted together I played Valheim and I've played the beta for Black for Blood and I feel like of those ones that I've played, Valheim, my vote will definitely go to Valheim for games that I've played, but from what I've heard, it would probably have to go to It Takes Two. And the reason I want Valheim to be the winner for this one is because the multiplayer experience is, like it, like what Noon mentioned, it's an absolute blast. Like, you're, you're gathering, it's, it's it, you, I really get the sense of community because like we're slowly growing our tiny little village, like first off on our first day, like we're just punching these these tiny little saplings to get wood uh, branches so we can build our first tools. And the people will split up. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start working on the base, cutting down wood. The other person's gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna go hunting. And then it's gonna be, oh, I'm gonna go try to find the black forest. And then he finds a tomb and then he marks it out for all the, on the map for everybody to see. I, I just felt like there's this wonderful sense of community and uh, just, just the sense of, you know, actually having to interact with each other to make a, a working, you know, like to make a working survival camp, to make a working village, which I experienced mostly in like I'm not a big fan of survival games uh, I'll, I'll say that but I really thoroughly enjoyed Valheim and probably for the same reason that I enjoyed Minecraft in that sense that I felt like there was a real community being built around playing this game I can't imagine playing Valheim solo but I do for example I play Monster Hunter Rise I've played Back for Blood close beta with randos and that was like the experiences were okay because of the moment to moment gameplay but I really feel like Valheim put a lot of emphasis on playing it with friends and I feel like that's the way it was meant to be played and I thoroughly enjoyed it so I do think that Valheim should be winning, just based off of what I've played. Mm. I agree. You know, Del, we we remember our first day in Valheim very differently. I remember there was a lot of trees falling and a lot of dying. But yeah, yeah there, there were there were there were people <laughs> getting hit by trees that were falling. But isn't isn't that part of building a community? Like you I know, so. remember remember how we like we, we took like two and a half hours on the last boss because we never upgraded our armor. We never upgraded our weapons. We never crafted fire resist potions. And at some point, we just built a portal there because we kept dying. So we just had to keep going back over and over and over again. Like literally throwing bodies at the boss, running from like one, one of these flying death skeeto enemies. So was just camping the portal. So the moment you spawned out, you you might get stabbed if you don't run. It's yeah, like, yeah, it's... you know, that, that, that kind of utter chaos, I don't feel like you can have outside of a multiplayer experience. And I feel like Valheim did a really good job of letting us experience all these things that we can only do uh with friends hmm. you know so okay. so if you if you're going to make us choose which ones of these games are favorites Valheim. but we're gonna yeah. be kind of like pretentious getting it goes to it takes <laughs> <laughs> yeah Just, yes. I, I i don't really have a proper opinion on it because i haven't played it yeah but i hear a lot of good things about it but i do want to play it without spoiling myself yeah like i might yeah. pick it up try playing it something maybe maybe we could play it 
like live streaming it. Off first off cool down live streams. Oh, streamer life. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our next category, best sports and racing game or racing game. So it's F1, FIFA 22, Forza, uh, Hot Wheels Unleashed. Wow, <laughs> there's a new Hot Wheels game. Okay, uh, Riders Republic. You know, I'm so salty that FIFA 22 is here, but NBA 2K is not, because they're both bad games. But FIFA <laughs> is worse. I don't. <laughs> I can't believe FIFA is here. And I like, <laughs> yeah, I feel like any of any of the sport titles that come out every year. Personally, like I know people enjoy them, but they're often just a rehash of the same game over and over again. You pay full price for the same game last year with a slight change in roster, and they even added like you know there was that whole controversy the, the same reason the uh, the entirety of the EU decided to change the way the loot boxes, like how much of loot boxes and that sort of gambling were allowed, was because of FIFA. And here we have a you know a new FIFA game and. Uh, People are still throwing buttloads of money at it for microtransactions of cosmetics. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. From what I've seen, the innovations in gameplay are just minor enough so that you think that it's a different game. But I really don't think that these annual sports games should, like, even belong on these awards unless they actually do something drastically different. Which, as far as I can tell, they haven't. To me, they always just feel like cash grabs. But Kao, I don't think you're the kind of person who plays racing and sports games. Do you have any opinion on these games before I go ahead with mine? Mm, none, but I have heard good things about Riders. Uh, it looks quite different than every other game on this list. So yeah, I guess you can expound on that more. Yeah, well, I, I actually received a review copy of Riders Republic and I haven't shut up since, start, since I started playing it. Like, It's a really good game. Um, it's not deep. Uh, anyone can get into it. It's very accessible. But at the same time, it has features. Uh, the, the exploration of the open world in Riders Republic makes you f- wish that all of those features were also in all the other open world games that are being released. You know, just makes the, the, the Riders Republic. Sorry, Ubisoft made it. Ubisoft made the exploration of Riders Republic really, really fun. And I think they should apply. Um, the philosophies that they had in Riders in making Riders Republic to all of their other open open world games because it was just really fun exploring the world of Riders Republic and the whole world there the open world looks gorgeous and there's a lot of activities that you can do with other people there that just adds to the fun of exploration but from what I've heard Forza Horizon 5 appears to be uh, like even a game of the year candidate that's just how good uh, Forza Horizon 5 seems to be um, apart from being gorgeous it's one of the games that even though you have very far um, draw distances the the particles and the elements don't just you know uh, what do you call that uh, they don't render in even if you're really going really fast so it goes to show how optimized the game is uh, on the Xbox Series X and uh, on the PC but mostly in terms of gameplay, in terms of how the graphics look like, uh, from what I've heard, Forza, For- Forza Horizon 5 is even a Game of the Year candidate. But for me, in my personal opinion here, I'd... it's it's a toss-up between Riders Republic and NBA 2K22 just because I'm at NBA 2K show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Our next category is... Best sim or strategy game. So the nominees this year are Age of Empires 4, Evil Genius 2 World Domination, Humankind, Inscription, and Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'm gonna start this category by saying my one biggest request to the Game Awards is to separate simulators and strategy games. Please do not lump them in together (laughs) because I'm salty that Crusader Kings 3 and Total War 3 Kingdoms lost the years that they came out to some simulator game that isn't related to grand strategy at all. <laughs> so I really feel like simulator games, especially like games like that are like Microsoft Flight Simulator, which really isn't a strategy game, much of a strategy game is like really a hardcore simulator, doesn't feel like it should be in the same category. I feel like maybe they have a lot of nominees for this category if they separate the simulators out but it just feels weird for it to be lumped in together like that i don't know 
yeah, I can kind of see. I can see that because, like, for example, how easy it's not a very easy comparison point to you know compare Microsoft Flight Simulator to you know like Age of Empires 4, for example, uh, because the, the gameplay is kind of a little bit less comparison. You don't really have the complex systems that you find in Grand Strategy in Microsoft Flight Simulator because. It's a simulator game, and it, it's a damn good one. It looks really good. It apparently simulates, uh, you know, the actual experience of flying really well. But you know, it doesn't belong in the same category. I have to agree with that. Uh, from these games, have you? Which ones of these have you played? Are you? Two of these are on my to playlist. Actually, it's Humankind and Age of Empires Four, but I haven't personally played them yet. I've so, played Age of Empires Four twice. <laughs> since launch you know i'd like i'd love to sink more hours into age of empires 4 but the most that i've been doing recently is watch videos of it you know um i'm not sure if you're aware but there's also an esports industry around age of empires 4 people actually play competitive age of empires and i've been having a blast watching them and you know fantasizing that i was the one playing instead of them but from what I've heard, Microsoft Flight Simulator is also really good. And it actually showcases how flawed this category is. Because both Microsoft Flight Simulator and Age of Empires 4, in my opinion, uh, deserve to win this category. Microsoft Flight Simulator for, the, for it to win the Best Sim Award and for Age of Empires 4 to win the Best Strategy Game Award. I haven't played Humankind, so I can't give an opinion about it. But since I'm a big Civ fanboy, I'm kind of salty if ever Humankind wins. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm actually pretty interested in Humankind. I don't, I it's on my list, but I, my backlog is huge, and I told myself I wouldn't get a new game until I finish like at least two from that list. So I haven't gotten these two strategy games yet. I'm pretty hyped for them. Can't wait to play. Also, so, yeah. I'll give the recommendation to play Inscription. Uh, I've played it, and uh, it's from the creator of Pony Island, as you can expect. There's a lot of weird stuff going to go on. It's certainly not going to be the game you initially expect it to be. But I have to say it's a good game overall. Um, maybe there's some parts that might feel a little bit frustrating because of the roguelite element, uh, where there's a lot of RNG involved. But, um, yeah, because sometimes your strategies kind of fall apart in the face of RNG, but Overall, it's worth playing. The card game mechanics in it are interesting. The uh, the, the, the mechanics that surround the card game, the, the sort of escape uh, escape room roguelite thing that they have going on is something that it's, it's sort of like a space of uh, crossovers of genres that I didn't I've never seen before. And I really think that Inscription is worth play. Well, is Inscription published by Devolver Digital? Would you know? Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. It, is, yep. it, is. It, it kind of feels like that kind of game. And it's actually interesting to see it here instead of in the best indie game category. It just goes to show it's also how. There. Oh, was it? Oh, I yeah. just missed it. Okay. Yeah, all right. Let me rephrase that. It's interesting to see it here as well. You know, competing against these other games, uh, just goes to show that indie games are worth your time, even though they have smaller budgets. Doesn't mean that they're far worse off than AAA games. So, yeah. Uh, shout out to Inscription. You guys should totally play it. All right, next category, best family game. It takes two, Mario Party Superstars, new Pokemon Sma Snap, Super Mario 3D World, and Bowser's Fury, and WarioWare. So this is a bunch of, this is definitely a Nintendo-dominated category, isn't it? All well, Nintendo's yeah, kind, of why. kind of games, so. <laughs> Literally four out of the five. <laughs> Not very surprising, I'd have to say. Yeah, that's well, true. You know, it's, it, it, it for me it'll feel feel weird to uh, choose it takes to, I I mean technically technically wise uh, out of these five games I think it takes two is the best game but mm. feels weird to call it a family game especially since the premise talks about uh, you know um, a divorcing couple who's trying <laughs> to fix their relationship uh, for me I, I think uh, uh, for me family games are casual games that anyone mm -hmm. in the family can play and you can play bite-sized so mm -hmm. uh for me the best mario game party. here no not Mar mario part no not mario party superstars mario party mm -hmm. games take up so much time 
that dad oh, won't I... be able to go to work the next day if you played it. Oh, right. So not Mario Party. <laughs> I think the best game here for me, for for in terms of uh, everyone in the family having a good time, I think it's WarioWare Get It Together. I'm not sure how much experience you guys had uh, in previous WarioWare games, but it's tons of fun. Um, anyone in the family can play it. It's very um, accessible. And it only takes short time to boot up and to play, and it doesn't really take a lot of you know investment from anyone. Things like Super Mario 3D World, I feel like you should be invested in completing the levels. Uh, Pokemon Snap is not. I I'm not sure if it's a multiplayer game, but uh, taking pictures of Pokemon with everyone in the family doesn't seem so. Engaging. Enticing or engaging to me, you know, dad and mom will get bored eventually. But for something like WarioWare, I think even dad and mom could enjoy mm. playing it. Yeah, you know, I have played WarioWare. Like one of my siblings has the latest WarioWare, and we've also played some of the older WarioWares. And I have to agree with you. Like it's it's very simple premise, really easy to pick up, and it's a lot of fun. Like, uh, in the latest WarioWare, I don't know if it's true about everywhere, but in the latest WarioWare, when you're playing multiplayer, basically every single character has a different control scheme. And uh, you pick three of two to three of them, and you guys will play either, you guys will either play against each other or cooperatively to complete all these, this whole bunch of very, very quick, very bite-sized mini-games. And uh, it really is a lot of fun. Uh, it's, a, it's not only a family game, it's a really good party game. Uh, you know, just to sit around, play with friends, casual fun when maybe in the middle of a house party or something. If you haven't played it before, I would definitely give the recommendation to at least try it out. It's not really something that has a lot of depth to it. It's not really something you're going to sit down and sink your teeth into. But it's a lot of, for like everything that it's trying to be, it most certainly is. Hmm. Alright. For our next category... But fighting game. So it's Demon Slayer, The Hinokami Chronicles, Guilty Gear Strive, Melty Blood Type Lumina, Nickelodeon All Stars Brawl. Wow. Then okay. Virtual Fighter Five Ultimate Showdown. Mm, I haven't played a new fighting game this year. A level These aren't with you the guys usual have only ones, played one game, <laughs> and I don't usually also play fighting games. Yeah. I have watched two of the three of the games here. Uh, those being Melty Blood, Guilty Gear, and the Nickelodeon All Stars Brawl. And I don't honestly know why the All Stars Brawl is here. Uh, <laughs> it's it a is technical riddled... nightmare, from what I've heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but from what I've seen, what I've heard is an absolute technical nightmare. It's, it's, it's buggy for a fighting game. There's so many infinite juggles. Like I've, I've seen people like there, there are certain characters that will like because it is basically Smash, right? Except with. Nickelodeon, Nickelodeon characters. characters. I've seen people who have like zero, like they have zero damage taken. They just immediately take a fall. Wow. It's like, <laughs> it, it, it is riddled with technical issues. It is riddled with balancing issues. I, I don't know if they just didn't have anything else to pick. I feel like there's a game, there's probably a, like, uh, there's most certainly a game out there that deserves this title way more than this title does. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's here in the nomination slot. I don't think it should be here, but. Yeah, that's that's what I have to say about it. <laughs> yeah, well, there hasn't been a lot of new fighting games this year. If I'm going to think back, you know, Demon Slayer being here is also a testament to that. Because usually this is um, the space for Street Fighter, for Tekken, for even, heck, Dead or Alive. But none of yeah. those games were released this year. We don't have a new Mortal Kombat or Injustice. So we have these, you know... Yeah tier 2 fighting games here wow <laughs> but you know I, I played Demon Slayer oh, they're gonna come for you <laughs> I played Demon Slayer uh, I enjoyed it a lot um, for anime fans it's going to uh, people uh, anime fans who's going to play this game will have a blast especially for those who have been watching Demon Slayer because it's also be a, uh, technically it's a good game doesn't have a lot of bugs uh, fighting is fluid but it's not the kind of fighting game that will have, you know, a very big esports community. It's not going to have big esports tournaments out of it. Uh, it. It just doesn't have that widespread appeal. So I don't see it winning this or even deserving winning the best fighting game of the year. I don't know about Guilty Gear and Melty Blood. Those are like the uh, games that are always in things like EVO but always just like side events. So I'm not sure how... Uh, appealing they are to win this year's event 
But you know, Nickelodeon being here makes me anticipate for next year when we get the Warner Bros. version of this, where we can see <laughs> Batman beating down Rick and Morty for some reason, and the Flintstones or whoever else. It's going to be uh, interesting here next how, year. I don't know how excited I am for that prospect. <laughs> I, I'm not excited for the game. I'm excited for the hilarity the that will ensue. Yeah, the memes. I see. Yeah. I see. All right. Next one, best RPG: Cyberpunk 2077, Monster Hunter Rise, Scarlet Nexus, Shin Megami Tensei 5, and Tales of Arise. Okay, this one I actually played one of these. <laughs> I haven't finished it, but I have. I have. I am like some way into Tales of Arise, and it it's pretty fun. It's just that I'm swamped with a lot of other things to do and I haven't sunk my teeth into it. Cyberpunk, I'm sure a lot of people have a lot to say about it being here, with the launch that it had and the middling review scores. It isn't. Uh, the second coming of Jesus Christ in terms of video games, unfortunately. Like, everyone expected it to before launch. So, yeah. The other games are actually pretty interesting, and they're also on my to-playlist, but I haven't gotten around to them yet. Uh, I've played Cyberpunk, I've played Rise, I've played Arise, and I've played a little bit of Scarlet Nexus, just enough to be familiar with the combat, uh, but then I watched the rest of it like I usually do. And I have to say, it's a pretty interesting spread. Um, SMT5, I have every plan of playing it. I was pretty interested in the series, but I never wasn't able to get into it. So with the remake of uh, 3 and 5 coming out, I actually feel like I can play it now, which is pretty good. Um, Cyberpunk? I don't know how to feel about this game. Like, I was excited for it. I wanted it to be good. There was a lot of it that was good, but there was also so much lacking in terms of it being a proper like RPG as we're familiar with it, character customization and even involvement of your character. Uh, it, it felt kind of strange because it, it felt like I was just playing a, a pre-made character, which I guess we were, but it was a lot of freedom that we weren't given in that game. It's got a Nexus, really good hack and slash uh, action type of game, not the strongest story. Arise is a nice in-between where, uh, as Tales games always have been, they've also been pretty strong in both the combat and the story department, and it does very well on both of those things. And of course there's Monster Hunter, which we already know it's always the same formula, but it's always good. Uh, there isn't really much story to be spoken of. I mean, there is a story, not that we really necessarily have to care about it. The gameplay is always amazing. So my vote in terms of like, because of what I would see as an RPG, my vote goes to Tales of Arise for this one. Hmm. Uh, for this one, I played Cyberpunk 2077. I played the demo Scarlet Nexus and it really feel like getting my teeth sunk into it too much. And SMT5 just released recently, so it's yeah, yeah, understandable that none of us have actually gotten our hands this game yet. But from what I've heard, SMT5 is the best SMT so far. <laughs> IGN actually called it like Persona without a heart and really angered a lot of fans. <laughs> <laughs> what um, a headline. The idea of Cyberpunk 2077 should be the best role-playing game of the year but given how the game panned out just so unfortunate just like a big massive missed opportunity for CD Projekt Red in executing Cyberpunk 2077 so yeah actually don't feel much about this category since I haven't played a lot of these games um, so I'll just go ahead and give it to Tales of Arise for how well received it is by my friends. So yeah, Tales of Arise. <laughs> All right. Next one, best, best action adventure: Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, Metroid Dread, Psychonauts Two, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, and Resident Evil Village. I've no, actually I heard a say, bunch of these games. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this 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 lineup looks very familiar to another category down the line. Though yeah. We, we mentioned that we looked here in the pre-front. Yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing quite a few of these games quite a bit. Ah, uh, sorry, anyway, you're saying? Uh, so yeah, I've heard a bunch about these games. I'm actually most surprised by how well Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy was received because like, we've heard of the previous Square Enix ADOS game that came out, the other Avengers game, which was like critically panned, everyone didn't like it. But then they came out with Guardians of the Galaxy and it's like, oh, it's like almost a complete turnaround from that one. Everyone that I've talked to that has played this or watched about watched the game seems to really enjoy it. Like the banter is really good, uh, the music is great, and it's pretty fun. It's like really fun to play. So I'm kind of actually intrigued, even if I'm not a big Marvel fan. 
I've also heard a lot about Metroid Dread. Uh, I've, a friend of mine has played it, and it's like his first Metroid game, and he's like really surprised at how much he likes it. So even if I'm not a fan of side scrollers, I'm kind of interested in it as well. I lastly, I also have Ratchet and Clank. It came in with my PS5 bundle, but I haven't started it yet. So I'm looking forward to playing it. Yeah. So I was a big fan of the original Psychonauts and uh, the games, the Ratchet and Clank games on the PS2, and I'm pretty excited to, I'm pretty excited for those games, but I haven't had the chance to play them. I've played a bit of Metroid Dread on the Switch, uh, I just borrowed a cartridge from my brother, but uh, it's one of my first uh, Metroidvania experiences in a while, and I, I'm reminded of why, you know, the whole Metroidvania genre was half named after the series, and it's just a blast to play Dread, and uh, it's. I actually advanced the story somewhat of Metroid. There's some pretty interesting developments towards the end, which I won't really get into. But yeah, yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. Same thing with Guards of the Galaxy. I didn't expect this game. I was looking at it, and I was looking at the original, the initial gameplay footage, especially finding out that you can only play as, you know, as Star Lord. So I was like, how could this be good? Because like, I, I imagine that, you know, if you're playing Guards of the Galaxy, you're gonna want to play all of the Guardians, right? But it turns out from the reviews that it's it's pretty good. So it's it's on my to playlist at some point. Don't know when that's gonna happen, but yeah. Uh, it's a pretty good spread because I haven't played enough of it. My vote only, my vote only goes to Metroid Dread because that's all I've played. As for me, um, all of these games are on my radar. I've been meaning to play Metroid Dread, but I haven't touched my Switch in a while. So I don't feel like getting into it just now. Probably somewhere down the line since it's a Metroidvania game and I'm really big into Metroidvania. Psychonauts 2 probably I'll play when I get an Xbox Series X whenever that is ratchet and clank i feel very you know uh, i i don't feel like buying it because it feels like the kind of game that will be part of ps plus offering somewhere down the line so i'll just wait for that to happen so it goes down to the two games that i've actually played this year Resident evil village i've completed twice and i've been having a blast replaying the mercenaries mode um for those who don't know here I'm a big Resident Evil fan and I've actually played all of the mainline games at the very least and I had a blast playing Resident Evil Village. It's just that the game was too short. Uh, that's the major complaint about that and that it doesn't have a lot of um, post-launch content. Uh, you know, Capcom promised that there's going to be post-launch content for Resident Evil Village down the line but they haven't really shared much information about that. So I'm really looking forward to more of that. And for the other game, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, it's very pleasant surprise. The kind of game that you'd expect to play, um, you know, the, the greatest games from the PS2 era for me were games like this. Linear, um, single player, you get to play without having to fuss about anything else, you know, because this, in our time now, we play a lot of live service games where you're always... Uh, running after some daily quests or for some limited time things none of that is in Guardians of the galaxy it's just it's just there and you get to play it anytime you want there's no fomo if you don't get to play it and the experience so far has been really fun and if i'm going to describe the games feels like playing with friends even though i'm not actually playing with any friends because just how good the banter is between the guardians of the galaxy and how lively the game is you know there's never a dead air in the game people are always talking and it makes the game feel so lively the experience is really fun even if you just play as star lord uh getting you, you still get to control the other guardians in a way because you give them uh you give them commands so you can have gamora slash against the enemies or have drax move a giant boulder from one place to another or to have Groot make a wooden bridge using his tendrils or to have rocket throw grenades at the enemy it's very uh it's very action filled it never has a dead moment but one of the problems i had with it just had too many cutscenes for an action game it had too many cutscenes it still feels very cinematic in a way so it feels like you're watching the movie you're watching a guardians of the galaxy movie and you get to play some of the action sequences that's how the game feels like 
So for me, I'll be giving the best action adventure game of the year to Resident Evil Village, but it's just a close margin uh, between it and Guardians of the Galaxy, just because Resident Evil Village, even though it's shorter, it has actually more uh, content, it has deeper gameplay elements than Guardians of the Galaxy. So yeah, it's RE8 for me. Hmm. All right. Next one, best action game. Back for Blood, Chivalry 2, Deathloop, Far Cry 6, and Returnal. Okay, this one I'm handing over to you guys. I haven't played any of these five. <laughs> uh, for um, me, I've only played Back for Blood among these games. And I could say that I played Far Cry 6 just because I played Far Cry 3. So yeah, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have played Back for Blood. I've played a bit of Deathloop. i played a bit of Returnal. And in the same way that uh, Newt has played Far Cry 6, I played Far Cry 6 because I played 3, 4, and 5. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, Far Cry 6, from what I've seen uh, from some of the reviewers that I've seen, it, it really is just more of the same. Um, Ubisoft, with their very formulaic, uh, as we've come to know the Far Cry series, basically liberate a slightly different layout of an outpost and a di- with a different scene, with a different weapon. But it's, it's pretty much the same. And this story isn't really that interesting to boot. Uh, Back for Blood was, it was fun. Um, I feel like there were some issues that it had, they had to iron out in the closed beta. And the card system requires a lot of grinding for an action game. I mean, sure, you can hop in and out, but sometimes you really don't feel like you're at the top of your game just because you don't have a very good deck in Back for Blood uh, because of the way that the card system works. So I think the best action game from what I've played would have to go between either Deathloop and Returnal. Um, Returnal is not really something that... uh, I expected to enjoy as much just play what little with what little I've played of, both in playing and watching. There's a lot of depth to it that you can't really see at first because initially it just looks like a very regular third-person shooter, but it's it's a brutal one and uh, it actually tells a really interesting story um, through its gameplay mechanics, which is something that's rather surprising. From uh, you know, initially people thought it was like, oh yeah, Return is kind of like a it, it looks like one of those games that could be a tech demo that came out with the next gen console, you know? Yeah, I've played Back for Blood. Uh, I played it a lot, you know, around 20 hours. But I can't give Best Action Game Award to it for the fact that it doesn't feel like it deserves it because it doesn't have a lot of content right now. And I, I really feel salty that it's so expensive for giving so. Le- uh, for for not giving a lot, you know, you have to buy the maps and the other DLCs is coming to the game in the future. I feel like the base game that um, Turtle Rock Studios offered for this game isn't isn't that much. So based off exp- uh, impressions alone, I think Returnal deserves the best action game of the year. I've watched a lot of gameplay videos of Returnal and it does look really fun. But it's again, it's another game that I think is coming to PS Plus somewhere down the line. That's why I've been holding <laughs> off buying it. But yeah, I, I, I think it's a really good game that deserves to get the best action game of this year. For the next category, we have best VR and AR. Uh, since none, none of, of the three of us <laughs> have any VR setup, uh, this one will probably skip. Yeah, but if you're going to ask for my opinion, I think it's Resident Evil 4 just because of how good the base game is and they were just able to translate it well into the VR and AR space. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next one, innovation in accessibility. This one I haven't been able to explore very much. Uh, I have heard, like, I have seen like Ubisoft's general accessibility options. They are really extensive. Uh, my first-hand experience of this would be for uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So I've seen their ac- different accessibility menus. There really is a lot. I'm not sure. I feel like a lot of it translates to Far Cry because of how similar the gameplay is. It's just mostly a difference in viewpoint since Assassin's Creed is third person. But it's the same kind of gameplay loop. So I assume there's a lot of like different uh, color settings for icons, stuff on the map text to speech stuff like that so yeah i haven't played the other four so not sure about those uh ubisoft has 
done been doing pretty well with the accessibility recently uh mm-hmm. as far as i know the just how extensive far cry 6's accessibility options are they include like changes to your reticle uh soft locking for aiming like aim assist soft lock and you can change the intensity of just how much you want the soft lock it for people with motion sickness you can turn off camera shake uh you can turn off the effects of when your character is poisoned or drunk uh the reticle sway uh, there's a there's a lot of options but similarly to you because i haven't played these games i don't really have a lot of first-hand experience with the accessibility options available to them so i can't really say uh i can't really say much for this category in particular nor do i think that i have the right to pick a winner mm. yeah um i just want to highlight how important accessibility is and why i think this award is very important um this Accessibility. These accessibility features are meant to bring games to more audiences and to let a wider, um, a wider audience to be able to enjoy these games. So, for us, um, regular people, you know, uh, we barely think about these things, and they're mostly just good to have things, you know. But for a lot of people, they can't play these games without having these accessibility options. And it's a really big deal if these accessibility options are there in a game because they get to experience them in a way that is not detrimental to their experience. And um, well, I can't also I, I don't also don't feel like I have any right to choose from any of these, mostly because I haven't played some of these games, but also because I don't really feel. The effects of these accessibility options, you know, I'm not the market for these options. Mm-hmm. But from what I've heard, Forza Horizon 5 has the most extensive accessibility options out there, and they're even planning to add more. You know, you've never heard about accessibility options as post-launch content before, but that's what Forza is doing, and they're going to be adding even sign language support in mm-hmm. future patches, which I think is amazing. Although I don't know why, because you can, uh, you know, uh, that's what I'm saying. I'm not the market, so I don't understand why these some of these features are being added. But you know, my 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 reaction with sign language being added is, can't you just add subtitles to describe what's happening? You know, but yeah, uh, again, I'm not the I'm not the market. But it's also really nice for these developers. To be reaching out to a wider community to make their games more accessible to a wider audience. So, yeah, yeah. Um, we can have like a whole episode talking about accessibility. We probably will sometime in the future. Uh, but the fact that this award exists uh, means two things for me, at least. I feel like it means one that it's putting into spotlight the fact that we do need these accessibility options. Because like, what what is person like personalizations for us to make the gameplay experience better for us is a matter of playability for other people. People with disabilities. Uh, whether like motor disabilities or other things, might not actually be able to play these games or enjoy these games, even if they want to have those experiences, just because of the lack of accessibility. And I feel like another point that this has is that we have this award, uh, but what we should be doing is setting these the winners of these awards as the gold standard. Like all games should have accessibility options, and I think it's time for the gaming industry to really iron out like what. Accessibility options all games should have, whether it be something as simple as turning off like camera shake, uh, head bob movement, uh, the addition of subtitles, uh, the addition of closed captioning more than subtitles to be able to describe what's going on in the sequences for people who are hard of hearing, mm. uh, more visual cues, colorblind options. Those should be a standard among all video games. And the fact that this award exists also states that this, you know, we're, we're not pushing for it enough as an industry. Yeah, definitely. I feel like uh, because it is an award, it's more of like a plus point instead of a requirement, something like that. So I I wish that the industry as a whole starts pushing for more accessibility options on the whole, like in general, for more games. But, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, fully agree. All right. Next category: Best Community Sport. Ah, finally. Okay, so for this one, the nominees are Apex Legends, Destiny 2, Final Fantasy XIV Online, Fortnite, and No Man's Sky. This I... one should go to FF14. I'm sorry. <laughs> If it doesn't go to FF14, I don't know. I'm gonna riot because I, I... yeah. I have a point to refute there, though. Mm. Well, I have two points to make. First of all, Apex Legends should not be on this list. <laughs> I... 
<laughs> I, I see. I, Apex is probably the game that I've played the most of in the last, like throughout the entirety of the pandemic since season seven, uh, mm. season six maybe even. I've played it continuously. I skipped only one season then. It does not belong on this list. Apex respawn takes forever to listen to its players, and until now, there's a lot there. Oh, well, for one thing, maybe they are actually like they could be starved of dev support. Like I can't really say because uh, in some of the interviews, that did seem to be the case. But on the other hand, they, they they're not really listening to the feedback of the community, or perhaps there's just no way to work around it without uh, having to take time off from the monetization system that they're doing. A lot of people have been asking for uh, taking one season off, no new content, fix what's broken right now. Apex Legends has had a rampant cheater problem ever since its release, and it's back right now. Like just now, I've, I've been grinding black. I've been grinding back to uh, to platinum in, in Apex Legends, and it feels like every third game. I encounter a cheater or a smurf and it's so obvious when they're playing when you spectate them and you can see their bullets magnetizing the enemies and this is not a new problem i've had this problem since i started playing way back when like two years ago three years ago yeah community support apex legends no shoot mm -hmm. also my second point no man's sky uh mm -hmm. i feel like I, as much as i love ff14 and i do agree that the devs have shown just how much they've expressed and they've shown us over and over just how much thought and love they put into the game we have to give credit where credit's due with No Man's Sky. Uh, because of reasons with publishers, because of reasons with uh, their initial plans, they had promised too much and they faltered right at the beginning. But since then, they've been releasing major update after major update. And these aren't just like these aren't just like bug fixes, small patch notes. These are this is like entirely new content that they've been adding to the game completely free uh, ever since a few years ago. Like the game has evolved in, in a way that it's far like by far so much more than they even promised it to be initially back when it was controversial and like I, I don't think i've ever seen a dev co have a comeback story like a revival story of the game that strong especially considering no man's sky generated a lot of revenue they could have taken that money and run but they didn't instead they continue to support the game for free without changing its price they even brought it down from its initial release price and they, they're still planning on releasing new content for free in the coming months like like that that kind of support is insane like because they knew they did wrong um they decided to fix their mistake and then do so much more than that and i feel like no man's guy deserves props for that hmm. i'm gonna keep this simple as someone who pre-ordered no man's sky i'm gonna give it to no man's sky mm. I understand. Uh, I feel like No Man's Sky would be the only game I wouldn't be as salty for FF14 losing. But I'm, uh, I'm, sh I think both FF14 and No Man's Sky are in the best ongoing category as well. So I hope they win well, like one each. I really, really appreciate FF14's uh, community support. Like more than I, I would rather they win community than ongoing even, since you know they did have delays in Endwalker Ultimate did get delayed. I mean, those are like pandemic things, sure. But I feel like their response to the community in general is very, uh, I don't know, very sincere. I mean, even when Endwalker got delayed, like it's only two weeks before the release date and it got delayed. Sure, a lot, like they already anticipated that a lot of people would be angry. A lot of people took paid leave for the launch and now it's going to be moved by two more weeks. And then it's like going to hit the holiday season. And like we saw Yoshi P personally apologize to all of us. It's like I saw an outpouring of support for the devs instead of people getting like angry <laughs> like most people do during delays. So it's kind of, I feel like No Man's Sky and FF14 both deserve to be here. I hope they both take one each off of best community and best ongoing game. So yeah, that's it. That's my take on this. Uh, Yeah. All right. For the next category, best mobile. So it's Fantasia, Genshin Impact, League of, League of Legends, Wild Rift, uh, Marvel, Future Revolution, and Pokemon United. I've actually played two of these games. So I played Genshin and Pokemon. I got into Genshin this year for the first time uh, due to a lot of friends like trying to convince me to finally play it. It's actually a lot of fun. Just don't let yourself get eaten by the predatory gacha monetization and yeah I, I really enjoyed it Pokemon Unite is also fun with friends I play a bit of it uh, but I'm 
I think I'm too used to like PC MOBAs to really get into it much. So I think I would give this to Genshin. Fantasian does look interesting though. I hope it gets released for Switch, then I'll get it. <laughs> so yeah. I have also only played uh, Genshin quite extensively and then very little of Pokemon Unite. And Genshin is a great game at its core, but it does suffer from all of the pitfalls that other gotchas do in that there's power creep, in that uh, a lot of the there's a lot of FOMO involved in making you play the game uh, with the dailies, with the limited time banners when you don't know the reruns are coming around, uh, with the limited time events that have limited time rewards. It, it just took away so much from my experience of Genshin and it just made me quit the game just because of how much upkeep it, how much of my time it sort of demanded for upkeep because I wanted to stay ahead of the curve where I initially was because I was an early adopter. So, you know, I'm not a fan of that system and because of that, I can't really be that big of a fan of Genshin Impact even if I'm a fan of the core mechanics uh, with the combat and the, the reaction system especially. I found that to be a lot of fun. So between those two, they have to go to Pokemon Unite because they made a really nice, accessible MOBA that uh, has just the right amount of depth to be easy to pick up and easy to play and still provide enough for people who want a little bit more than just the simplicity that a lot of mobile games can have. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, Genshin Impact is great. It's just that it's fired by a lot of uh, problematic practices. Um, mostly go into the publisher side of things so uh, I'll give this category this award to Pokemon Unite as well I just really love how they were able to streamline the mobile experience to make it accessible to everyone and to actually put a time cap on a mobile game because you know Dota games can go for two hours long and I just really appreciate that Pokemon Unite you know that you're done in 10 minutes because I want to play MOBA games and know when I'm going to stop playing that that particular match. You know? So yeah, Pokemon Unite for best mobile game of the year. Mm. Alrighty. Next one, best indie game. 12 minutes, Death's Door, in- Inscription, Kenna Bridge of Spirits, and Loop Hero. Uh, my personal best indie game of the year actually isn't here in the nominees, but it's a... Uh, Sur- survival simulator game called Going Medieval. It's basically pixel, uh, voxel 3D RimWorld. If you guys have played RimWorld, you'll know that it's a deep colony colony sim where you have like different villagers and you build a base, try to survive the harshness of uh, four seasons and the- yeah, stuff like that. Except Going Medieval is 3D and it's all in the medieval era. So there's no like sci-fi mechanics in there. I really enjoyed it, even if it's still like in early access, that would be my best indie game. I actually feel like I bought a lot more indie games than AAA games this year, which is kind of surprising. Uh, I played a bunch of smaller indie like city builders, simulators, stuff like that. But yeah, for me it would be Going With Evil, which isn't here in the list. So, how about you guys? Well, for me, uh... I think I'll go for Kena and... You know, I'm wondering why Valheim is not in this list, but I'd also go for Valheim here. But if you're going to allow me to have a little bit more fun, you know, for the memes, mm. I'd vote Crab Game here. You know, just some <laughs> stupid fun to play with friends. So go try play Crab Game when you want to have a party game with your friends, guys, over Discord. You'll never regret. You probably would, but yeah, just try it. Um, for me, like I said, I've mentioned before, I've played Inscription and I've heard really good things about Loop Hero. But I feel like my, based off of how much I've played, like Inscription, a definite recommend, but maybe not my indie game of the year. Um, I feel like my indie game of the year would have to be a little game called Gunfire Reborn, available on Steam. It did not release this year, but it's 1.0 just came out, like literally yesterday. They just had their 1.0 release from Early Access. And it's a game that I've played on and off. It's an FPS roguelike, and it's a lot of fun. If you enjoy like creating, uh, trying to figure out how to make broken builds, and the the gunplay just feels so solid. Like it, I would say that from what little I've played of it, Gunfire. I mean, what little I've played of the game, I'm going to compare it to. Gunfire Reborn has better, if not similar, gunplay to the likes of Destiny, 
Uh, and I, I commend Bungie for having good gunplay, but Gunfireborn has the same thing in a nice indie package. And it's created by a small, I think, uh, developer out of Hong Kong. So yeah, their 1.0 just released. I don't know if that counts, but they would definitely be my indie game of the year if that did count. Hmm. All right, next one, best ongoing. See, oh, this time No Man's Sky isn't in. I didn't remember. All right, so the nominees are Apex Legends, FF14, Fortnite, Genshin Impact, and Call of Duty Warzone. I'm actually surprised Warzone is here. Didn't I? I've seen like a bunch of press about Warzone and they weren't like all positive. Yeah, Same with Apex. The sheer user base, Call of Duty Warzone is really definitely gonna take the cake here just for just how many people are playing it, especially mm -hmm. stateside. But for me, I'd go for Genshin Impact here. Even though it has predatory uh, monetization practices, the game itself, the content rollout is, in my opinion, good enough and enough to get it nominated here i don't play the other games so i, I really can't um talk much about them so i'll i'm going for genshin impact in this category hmm. mine would go obviously to ff14 though i would have to say that 2021 isn't their strongest year i feel like 20, last year was stronger for them 5.3 was really good uh, this year is a bit slower because Endwalker got delayed, so there was like a, there's a really long content slump this year, which is kind of interesting because they still made it to the nominations even with the slump. So, no, they I did like, have a massive influx of uh, people from other MMOs coming in. That's true. That's true, though. Even so, with nothing coming out until this December. For me, best ongoing again, love hate relationship with Apex. I love that game to bits. Doesn't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, like, you know, if we, we get free updates all the time. New character, some changes to an app, new map, uh, some events along the way. Like, I can completely forgive all of the the incredibly expensive microtransactions for cosmetics because they're just that, they're cosmetic. It doesn't really matter in the gameplay. I love the game to bits, but I feel like there's still a lot that has to be asked for. Even if, even if you say that it's a free-to-play game, there's just a lot that I feel like Apex has been lacking in focus and direction from what there's like a big disconnect between what the devs are delivering compared to what the players are asking. So that's why I don't feel like it necessarily uh, deserves the nomination in its current state. Um, FF14 did not play much of it this year, uh, but like Cal said, our strongest year was probably in the time of just Shadowbringers uh, and all of the patches that followed that. And because Endwalkers got delayed, we don't really have much to say about it. But I'm pretty, you know, I'm excited to see what they're going to do with Endwalker. So it gets my vote. And uh, as for Genshin, uh, the free updates have been rolling out, especially the story updates and all the little mini games. I can see that being a lot of fun, but I still feel like, for me especially, it's overshadowed by all of these predatory gotcha systems and the, the fear of missing out systems that they have in place, which is what ruined my experience with Genshin Impact and why I stopped playing the game entirely. So yeah, my vote goes to FF14. But you know, guys, probably Fortnite should. I, I, we don't play it, but I think Fortnite's also a cultural phenomenon that mm. should at least, uh, you know, it kind of deserves being here. But I just don't really play it. But from the the news that I cover uh, on Fortnite, I think it's also one of the best ongoing games out there, especially yeah. with the content rollout and all of those. You know the crazy Collabs. collaborations that they have. You know Naruto yeah. is there in Fortnite now. Yeah, yeah. Sasuke... only in Fortnite can you see Ariana Grande <laughs> fighting Sasuke with Travis Scott. <laughs> yes, like, I saw and Thanos that. Thanos and like, yeah, it's insane. Even crazy. Rick's there, right? Like Rick and Morty. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we don't like Fortnite, but you gotta give the respect it deserves. They're, they're an absolute titan, and I do think yeah. that they belong here. Yeah, but I don't cool. have an opinion of the game. I feel like we'll keep seeing them here on the in this category nominated for a long while yet. They've already won previously, but I feel like they're gonna be kept keep getting nominated for a long time. <laughs> All right, next one. Games for impact. Mm, I haven't Ooh, played nice Genshin Impact here. Please, <laughs> lol. Please. Uh, these are. I've heard of Boyfriend Dungeon, but I haven't gotten around to it. I. Haven't really played like a full fledged uh, virtual novel ever, so maybe one day I'll get around to it. Uh, Life is Strange True Colors, I haven't played. I have played the first Life is Strange, but not the new one. It's also quite recent, so I haven't gotten time to get play it. 
I have heard of Chicory. Uh, it looks interesting. And yeah, the other ones are new to me. I only heard of them when we checked out the awards. So yeah, uh, same thing here. Say for Life is Strange because it was, you know, it's a big. Uh, the the original game was kind of big at the time of release. Mm. I have, I have not heard of any of these games. Like I, I might know a couple of them by name, but I I know too little to have a proper opinion. I'll be honest. Mm. I think these are the games that would have been hot if I were in college, if I were still in college. But they've mostly flown under my radar, so I also have no opinion about these games. I, I, I know about Life is Strange True Colors, but it also feels like it's already outdated. To me, I, it's not the kind of game that I would see myself playing. Although I think, you know, I think it takes to deserves a spot here as well, in mm. terms of from what I've heard about it affecting relationships and mending um you know just just the impact it has on the relationships of the people who have been playing it i think it takes to deserves a spot here but since it's not here then i'm just skipping this category all right next one best performance so hmm i actually okay let's read through it it's erica mori as alex chen from life is strange uh, Giancarlo Esposito as Anton Castillo from Far Cry 6, Jason Kelly as Colt Van from Deathloop, Maggie Robertson as Le- Lady Dimitriscu from Resident Evil Village, and Ozioma Akaga as Juliana Blake from Deathloop. I guess in terms of like as someone who has not played any of the games that they start in, like in terms of star power, you have Giancarlo Esposito. But I feel like in terms of like gaming impact, like how many people were talking about the performance it has to go to Maggie Robertson, right? <laughs> you know, it would I have mean, been easy for Giancarlo Esposito to win this award if only he had more screen time in Far Cry 6, but he didn't. So, from <laughs> and, all of these games, um, I've only really played Resident Evil Village, but I don't also think that Lady Dimitrescu deserves to have a spot here. I think <laughs> I, I had more memorable moments with the Duke than with Lady Dimitrescu. <laughs> I mean, Lady Dimitrescu did have a really good impression, but not in the level that she's going to win any awards for this year. So, for me, I'm also going to have to skip this, this, uh, this category. Mm. Uh, I have the same opinion about uh, Giancarlo Esposito because his screen time is minimal in Far Cry Six, a lot less than you might expect, and also because. Far Cry isn't really the game to do justice for writing character, dialogue, or a story that would really <laughs> be able to bring out the best in an actor or actress, I think. Yeah. You know, if I were uh, forced to to choose someone outside of mm. these candidates, I'd choose the the voice actor of the narrator of um, Disco, Elysium? Disco Elysium, the final cut. Yeah. yeah. The, that ah. performance was really good. You yeah. know, that was actually, on, on that uh, on that note with this collision, that was his first VA gig. He's normally a musician. Wow. Yeah, he made the music for the game, actually. <laughs> yeah, and he recorded like, what, oh. 300 hour, hour, 30 hours of dialogue, something like that? Yeah, a he lot deserves of dialogue. to be here. Mm. What the shame. But that, te- technically speaking, the game didn't come out because... Yeah, it is a really I, I don't know if it counts, because, but then the final cut only came out this year, and the final cut is the only one that had that, the, the, the narration, the full voice acting on everything. Mm. Yeah, so... PGA did him dirty. I just get it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if if I had all the power in the world, I'd give it to him, whoever he is. Yeah, it would I be uh, his name right now. Then <laughs> Paul Brown. Yeah, him. All right. Next category. Whoa. Best audio design. So Deathloop, Forza Horizon Five, Ratchet and Clank, Rift Apart, Resident Evil Village, and Returnal. I'll give this one to you guys. I haven't played these five. Yeah, I've only played Deathloop, and I've heard, I've watched enough Forza Horizon Five. I am, for my my vote definitely goes to Forza. Um, it just, well, I, I I guess there's some part of me that is a big fan of like cars and uh, vehicles and the engine noises, and it's just so crisp, so well done in Forza. Like every every single road texture sounds different. Every single car sounds right. And, yeah, the, the soundscape that you experience in that game 
uh, even just from the promotional videos or the let's plays that I've seen, because I haven't had a chance to play Forza Horizon 5 properly. Amazing. Um, I've only played Resident Evil Village from these games, and from my, you know, untrained ear, it sounds like a typical Resident Evil game. Nothing special. <laughs> Mm. Uh, and I haven't heard much about the audio design of the other games, so I really can't form any opinion here. Um, but yeah, from what I've heard about Forza as well, the audio design is very immersive. It really feels like you're driving through Mexico, is what I've heard. So mm. if I were going to give anyone the award here, I'd give it to Forza Horizon 5. All right, best score and music. So, The Artful Escape, Cyberpunk 2077, Death Loop, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, and Near Replicant. So, this one, I haven't played them, but I'm pretty sure I listened to a bunch of Near Replicant tracks already because I always listen to Keiichi Okabe's work. It's amazing as always. So, shout out to him here. You know, <laughs> Guardians being here is kind of like a bit of cheating. Because they have a lot of pop culture songs in that game that really, you know, those songs really fit the the bill in, in the scenes that they're in. But I still feel like it's cheating because they don't really actually compose those songs for specifically for that game. Um, well, this, this, this particular category isn't necessarily OSTs, so it's not necessarily an original soundtrack. It's just, you know, the choices of music that they made. So I feel like it's, like, as much as it is cheating in a way, it's fair that Gardens is here. Yeah, okay. Because like, but, somebody but, still like, you know, went through the process of picking the right songs for the, the mood that they were going for. Yeah, so so in that regard, I think Guardians is a really good pick here because the, the song choices that they had, it's really fitting. Um, you, uh, the, the songs that they have really fit the mood of the scenes that they have and it really electrifies the action sequences in the game. Uh, especially if you have played this game, you know, when you do the huddle and you do it correctly, uh, it plays a pop culture song that really fits the mood of the current scene and it's really exhilarating when you start hearing and you know fighting aliens in the sound of the final countdown is really good stuff but from what i've heard the artful escape is just as good in terms of setting the tone and the mood of the game and it's actually all about that um creative expression uh it's it's in the name but just mm -hmm. basing off my experience, I'll give it to Guardians. But also, from uh, in terms of reputation, I'd also consider Nier here. Because even though I haven't played Nier, any of the Nier games before, I've always been listening to their soundtracks, which is just so good. So I don't know how it fits the gameplay, because again, I haven't played any of the Nier games. But yeah, it's uh, between Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, The Artful Escape, and Nier for me. I'm more like Cal in the sense that even if I haven't had the chance to play Replicant in particular, I did play uh, uh, Automata extensively with uh, all of the major endings finished. Keicho Kabe's work on the entirety of the Nier soundtrack, even from games that I haven't played, uh, it's always amazing. Especially that collab that they did in FF14 when they put together the Final Fantasy mm -hmm. Prelude and Way to the World. So yeah, I, I think that like I've I've listened already to the near sound to the replicant soundtrack, similarly to how I listened to the Gestalt soundtrack without even playing the game. And my like one of my most played songs on Spotify from last year, I think, was uh, Shadow Lord from the Gestalt and Replicant original soundtrack album. Like, I I just don't know how to describe it. There's just this grandeur, and the, he just captures the grandeur and the melancholy that the series has as a running theme for it so well in the music. And I really feel like Kei Chikabe should win this one. Hmm. Next one, Art Direction. So, Artful Escape, Death Loop, Kina Bridge of Spirits, Psychonauts 2, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. So, this one, since you can kind of get a sense of the art direction from impressions, I want to give it to Kina. When I first saw the trailer for this game, I was like, oh my god, it looks like a, like a high-end Pixar movie as a game. And it has like a lot of aesthetics that really I, I'm really into. So... It's actually the main reason why I want to play this game. The visuals look amazing, so I can't wait to get my hands on it. Are, are they cheating because they used to be like a film studio? <laughs> I guess that is why they are here. They get to carry over their expertise into the VGK yeah. industry. As I have to agree with that. Yeah. 
yeah, I'll, I'll keep on brief because I just have to agree with what Cal said with Kenna. But I also want to uh, just mention uh, the amazing and quirky art direction of Psychonauts 2. Like the original game also had its like it's it's weird. It's pretty out there, and it does it just carries it so well with such confidence that you can't help but love the strange and uh, wacky designs that they use in, in Psychonauts 2, as well as the Ratchet and Clank. Um, in terms of graphics, from what I've seen of it. I feel like that's my benchmark for what I would consider next-gen games in terms of graphics, just because of the way that they were able to make use of all the new technology, just make these absolutely dazzling set pieces in uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Yeah, I'm also going to give this to Kina just because of how, you know, in terms of art direction, if we're talking about how uh, everything falls into place in terms of how well they sit with your eyes, Kina is just really good to look at and really really relaxing to watch but in terms of graphical fidelity you have to give it to ratchet and Clank. just how beautiful the game is just how well rendered all of the assets are and just how well uh, insomniac was able to make use of the ps5's hardware to make it all happen so i'll give it to kena but with a big shout out to ratchet and clap Alrighty, next one, best narrative. Uh, that loop it takes to Life is Strange, True Colors, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, and Psychonauts. This one, I'll hand over again to you guys. I feel like narrative is something you have to have experienced firsthand to judge on. So since I haven't played any of these five, I don't feel confident picking a winner. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to hand this over to Newt because I haven't, <laughs> probably, <laughs> I haven't probably played any of these either. Uh, I've only played a little bit of Deathloop and I was in it for the gameplay because Deathloop is like a speedrunner's dream. But I haven't had a chance to properly experience the narrative uh, the way that Arcane Studios meant for it, which is kind of sad because like I'm a big fan of Dishonored series and I think like they, they did it was they were very well written. So I'm going to go back to Deathloop at some point so I can properly play through it and experience the story. But for now, I might just lay off this. Um. For me, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy's narrative was surprisingly good, and I think we have a very good opinion of it. Me and other critics of the game have a very, very good opinion of the narrative, only because we had a very low expectations out of it. So it was a nice surprise that it had a really good story. But in terms of overall narrative and how well packaged the story was and how well it was delivered, I'd, I'd give it to It Takes Two. And it really is something that you'll have to experience by yourself and with someone else, of course, because it's a two-player game. You have to experience it. Because it, it takes two to play. <laughs> so, I see. And, and uh, it's really hard to explain how well the narrative fits together without spoiling anything. So I'll just leave it at that. The best narrative for this year goes to It Takes Two. And you'll just have to play and to see for yourself why. Alright, next one, Game Direction. Uh, Deathloop, It Takes Two, Returnal, Psychonauts 2, and Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart. Oh, Ratchet & Clank is showing up in a lot of these categories. I'm really hyped to... I should probably start it soon. <laughs> Hell, it's Man. going to PS Plus. Just wait for it. I already have it though. As much as I want to say something about right. this, I also feel like game direction is something that you need to have played the game to yeah. completely experience. Yeah. So, I'm going to pass on this category. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, well, I think that this is something that you can base off on impressions. Uh, mm-hmm. in just, just in terms of, you know, the, the general idea and based off all of the other reviews that I've seen about that game, I think Returnal deserves to get this. Just for the mm. vision that the creators had for the game and how well they were able to uh, put things together to execute their vision. I think they did a really good job with Returnal. And I think more people should experience Returnal and get give it a try. It's a shame that it's a... I, I think it's a PS5 exclusive, isn't it? Or is, is yeah. it also in PC? Oh yeah, it's a PS5, it's PS5. exclusive. So, I hope it goes to PC soon, just like the other Sony exclusives that have been migrating to Steam recently, so that more people can get to experience it. Um, as for It Takes Two, it has a good vision, although in terms of innovations in gameplay, it doesn't have a lot of that. That's why Returnal inches a bit closer to the award compared to It Takes Two. 
but it also deserves some recognition for being able to achieve what it wants to achieve which is to bring two people closer together which i think is something more sublime for for uh, developers to achieve but yeah in terms of overall gameplay experience Returnal is just so innovative and the developers had this grand idea that they were able to bring together and execute well and yeah that's why i'm giving this award to Returnal all right we're at the big one so game of the year nominees this year are Deathloop It Takes Two Metroid Dread Psychonauts 2 Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart and Resident Evil Village I'm gonna start this because I probably have the least to say. This year, I is the first time in a long time that I actually have not played any of the Game of the Year exclusives because they weren't on my like most anticipated list. I feel like my Game of the Year would have been Endwalker if it didn't get delayed because it would have made the November deadline. So i'm actually it feels kind of weird especially with how strong last year was for me last year uh, i was having a hard time choosing between like ghost of tsushima last of us 2 uh crusader kings 3 also came out last year which three like all three of those are like pretty big games ff7 remake also came out last year so it was a really strong year for me 2020 Based, like based off of video games like a bunch of those games are like dreams come true finally ff7 remake after so long we've been waiting for it then ghost of tsushima is like the japanese uh samurai game of my dreams and it's finally here and then crusader kings 3 so like this year is i don't know i'm kind of disappointed but i guess it's not really the fault of anyone in the industry the covid has hit us very hard and a bunch of games got delayed into next year so yeah it's not really discounting from how good the game nominees are for this year. It's just that they don't particularly serve my tastes. So I'm giving this one to you guys. I actually can't choose a game of the year for this year, which is weird. <laughs> Between the choices given here, the only ones I've played are Metroid Dread and Deathloop, and I haven't even played either of those very extensively. So similarly to you, I don't know that I would have like from what I've heard, all of these are great games, and I don't really have a properly formed opinion of what I feel like could be game of the year among these choices. Um, given free reign to uh, pick my own game of the year, if it would still count as a separate release, which I still don't think it does, it would still have to go to Disco Elysium Final Cut. Mm -hmm. But if we're only picking games specifically that came out this year, I'd probably have to give it to uh, Tales of Arise, because that's the game that I've played properly that came out this year, and also because it, it there was something about being able to play a very a, a brawler type RPG that brought me back to like my feelings of childhood and my, my first experiences with like brawler type hack and slash JRPGs, where it just felt like it was like it was a very solid story as uh, a lot of Tales games have, and it has a very solid and deep combat system, deep enough that I could adjust the difficulty depending on how much you know how much combat depth I wanted or if I felt like button mashing, and the characters. A lot of them ended up being characters, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them ended up being characters that I cared about and characters that had depth. And uh, surprisingly, for the first time, no spoilers, but Tales of Arise had a happy ending, which is not common for Tales games. <laughs> Usually it's bittersweet, if not outright rather sad. And uh, it was a break in format, and it also dealt with a lot of heavy themes as Tales games often do. Like, they just, in Tales of Arise, there's a cold open into a society that has slavery, and uh, being able to overthrow the, the, the sort of thing this this and trying to bridge the gap between the division of the, the two major races in the game so yeah like my game of the year would have to be tales of arise if it was something that really came out this year and i as much as i would love to have a proper answer for any of these games i haven't had the chance to play them properly um i feel like this year has been a lot of going back to the old favorites like we mentioned before like i've been playing a lot of build i've been playing a lot of apex that's been most of my year this 2021. well if you guys had to guess you know, just so that we can end this with like a choice between the game of the year and we can keep score on who got it right. Uh, what do you guys think would win this year's GOTY? Oh. Oh, who uh, do you think we, we, would yeah, win? Yeah, yeah, just guess. Yeah. I think a lot of the time we have to consider like what kind of games usually win game of the year, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's usually the very blockbustery ones. So yeah. part of me doesn't feel like It Takes Two is going to win as much yeah. as I would like to see that. Um. I also don't know that. I also know that uh, Metroidvanias aren't everyone's cup of tea, so I feel like Metroid Dread might not win either. 
So I feel like the choices would be like between Deathloop, uh, Ratchet and Clank, Resident Evil Village, and shout out to Psychonauts 2 because there's that nostalgia factor of a game that's been in development for a very long time, the sequel that people have been waiting for for a very long time. But I think, I just have this gut feeling that it's going to be either Deathloop or Ratchet and Clank. One of those two. How about you, Cal? Based off I of impressions. Feel, I feel like, I feel the same as Del, but I would give a bit of an edge to Ratchet and Clank because it also has the nostalgia factor. It's kind of a well-known franchise. And um, hero platformers like this have always been like pretty strong showing for like Game of the Year things, especially since it's a first-party Sony exclusive. So if I had to like don the critic cap, it I would pick Ratchet. And you know, this selection is like a weird bunch, isn't it? Like, yeah. you wouldn't expect a lot of these games to reach this far in the nominations, uh, especially uh, for... Not to Met- mention that, and also like, having seen them in so many categories before this one. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, especially for Metroid Dread, because Metroidvanias don't usually get this much attention. The most mm-hmm. attention a Metroidvania game had, uh, if I remember correctly, went to Hollow Knight, but even then yeah. it didn't win a lot of awards. So it's actually refreshing to see Metroid Dread here. It Takes Two is also surprising because multiplayer games don't usually get this much attention, especially for your couch co-op games. Uh, Red Resident Evil Village feels so weird to see it here because it feels like it's been forever since it was released. But it was just this May. And I have to keep reminding myself, this has just been dismay when Resident Evil Village went out. So for me, I think, if I were going to guess, it's going to be you know, a toss-up between Psychonauts 2 and Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. But I think it's going to be Psychonauts 2 that's mm-hmm. going to win this year's Game of the Year. It's been so long since the release of the first Psychonauts and the second one just really blew blew the minds of the of critics everywhere you know i haven't seen a bad review of psychonauts 2 out there well same goes for ratchet and clank but psychonauts 2 had better and more consistently high reviews from what i've seen and it's just a shame that it's an xbox x or sorry xbox series x exclusive because i my my ps5 can't get to play it so (laughs) yeah but for my personal pick, I'd also agree with Del in picking Disco Elysium Final Cut if I could. But if I were strictly picking from the games from this year, uh, in terms of my personal tastes, I, I actually have a couple of nominees myself. Um, based off the, the, the games that I played, it's going to be a toss-up between Resident Evil Village uh, Riders Republic and yeah the the final cut of Disco Elysium so those three games are my nominees Resident Evil Village Riders Republic and the final cut oh if we are doing personal picks uh, mine would go to Mass Effect Legendary Edition <laughs> just because I really love that trilogy and it's great It's it's been great to revisit it though I do expect it to get dethroned by Endwalker by the time it comes out. If we're doing like a strict January to December, kind of 2021. So yeah, uh, I think that's it for us tonight. Uh, thank you guys for listening and we hope it's been a great year for you in terms of video games. It's certainly been pretty great for me. Uh, I got a lot of new games thanks to finally getting a Switch and everyone getting off my back about Fire Emblem and Legend of Zelda. <laughs> I can finally, finally play those games. Everyone keeps telling me, oh, you're gonna love this. I also have Animal Crossing, but I still live in a tent. So I'll get that house <laughs> one day. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that's me, Cal, signing off tonight. And How it's you Newt here. And Del. And uh, catch you next time. See you guys later. Stay frosty. Good night. <laughs>